Hello and welcome to My Career in Data, a podcast where we discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers. I'm your host, Shannon Kemp, and today we're talking to Christine Haskell. With a robust catalog of courses offered on demand and industry-leading live online sessions throughout the year, the Dataversity Training Center is your launchpad for career success. Browse the complete catalog at training.dataversity.net and use code DVTALKS for 20% off your purchase. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I am the Chief Digital Officer at Dataversity. And this is My Career in Data, a Dataversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management, to understand how they got there, and to talk with people who make those careers a little bit easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Today, we're joined by Christine Haskell, the founder at Christine Haskell Consulting LLC. And normally, this is where our podcast host would read a short bio of the guest, but in this podcast, your bio is what we're here to talk about. Christine, hello and welcome. Hi, nice to be here. Oh, I'm so glad you're joining us today. So, I, you know, you've spoken at a lot of our conferences and a lot of our events, and I'm so excited to hear how you got into data management. So, Tell me, you know, as an independent business, you know, what do you do for your clients and how do you work with data in your job? I empower data leaders to transform their cultures and to make data an integral service. And I do this in a couple of ways. I observe and listen to leadership to tailor solutions. I assess sponsors and teams for what um, literacy skills they want to develop. I collaborate with data leaders to help them determine a unified approach to data project management and change management efforts. Um, I facilitate workshops that increase data awareness and impact. And my approach comes down to um, proven methods, adaptive capabilities, and customized toolkits. And I do workshops and consulting engagements and teaching and research and all kinds of different approaches to that. Oh, I love that. (laughs) Um, (laughs) You work with a lot of data. Yes. (laughs) So, so, okay. So well, let's back up then, you know, um, tell me, Christine, you know, when you were say, you know, six years old, is this what you wanted to be when you grew up? That's like, I'm going to grow up and own my own consulting company and help people with their data. No, I I (laughs) don't think I showed up to kindergarten with my briefcase and said, (laughs) Um, no, but I always was a big reader, and I remember, um, you know, I had a big stack of National Geographics, and I was the kid reading the backs of cereal boxes and collecting labels, you know, for like uh, adventuring and anthropology and Tomb Raider kind of stuff. Um, and it was into science and things like that. But I don't, um, it, so it wasn't a huge leap for me to end up in English literature, right? Oh, uh-huh. And um, you know, fiction is where you find the most realism, ironically. And I was always interested in human dynamics and psychology. And later I was drawn toward advertising where um, I was some of the smartest people I ever met um, and particularly drawn to human behavior side of things where, you know, why we buy and why we do the things that we do um, and became inspired by sort of this anti-corporate movement uh, when I was graduating. Companies like Yankee Candle and Boston Beer and American Girl, those were all early companies before they sold out that organizations were pioneering sort of new forms of capitalism. And um, and then the Internet hit. And uh, I <laughs> I had this sort of like kind of, you know, it, it was at the height of the recession, kind of graduating at the height of the recession. And I I remember, you know, just these waiting rooms filled with um kind of you know 40 year old men and these these beige cubes going into nothingness and i was like i i i can't i can't compete like i can't you know and they they weren't looking at um candidates without experience and um the internet was a place of great diversity mm-hmm. and in the beginning anyway yeah and it was they were hiring sociology majors and english majors and it was just this incredible opportunity and uh long story short i ended up um 
in in a on my last dollar in New York with an interview in this little loft in uh, Hastings, New York, overlooking the Hudson River. And it was this sort of quintessential kind of startup on the water. And I was um, bombing, like just bombing. And I'm like, I, I have to end it. And um, so I looked at the guy and I'm like, look, I'm, I'm not going to get this job. It's perfect for me, but I'm not going to get it. And so if you could just give me some feedback, I'll be on my way. And he was like, sit right here. I'll have someone um, interview you. I'll, I'll have someone for you to meet. And he put me through the whole loop. And that was Seth Godin. That was Yo-Yo Dine. We got acquired by Yahoo. And that was it. Like, I was sort of, like, I got my break. And, um, you know, it was a great, it was a great ride. And I really fell in love with online consumer products. and the data behind all of these products and like why we make these decisions and why we click where we click and the systems that enable those, um, those, those, uh, you know, the, the features that we, that we play with. Um, and, and we were doing data before anyone else, like permission marketing yeah. was early data projects and, um, and Yahoo was doing data, the advertising tracking eyeballs and all of that stuff. And um, and so all of those companies gave me an early view of, of business intelligence before that became a function. Um, so that was sort of my path into the data space. Um, and I, I never could have planned it. Yeah, no, that's amazing. I love that. So, okay, so back it up a little bit. So, okay, so again, what was your major? English. English. So, and then you go out and you're in, there's not many job openings, but there's this new, and you just know you don't want to live in cubicle world. Um. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, the only jobs when, when you're graduating, then it was like, you can go write a manual or you can teach English. Oh yeah. So I'm like, it just felt like I was being paid to hold my breath underwater. Oh I, yeah. I can't, I can't do it. Like that's yeah. that. And so, you know, there were no project manage product management disciplines. There were no degrees and there were no degrees in any of this stuff. Yeah. And so it was sort of a wide open territory. Like it was like you could do, you could kind of do anything. Yeah. Webmastering was the only title that was out there. And I had, um, by then I had kind of talked myself into some roles. I had done um, the first online database for the Kauffman Foundation. I had as an English major, I had talked myself into a role for the back end. I had programmed the back end database um, using Cold Fusion. Oh, uh huh. That was an engineering role. Uh -huh. And I learned Cold Fusion code without, and there was no manuals and there was no, um, you just sort of had to learn by doing. Yeah. And I cried every day. I, oh. I was like, it was so hard. And, um, it was, uh, but it was an education and it was a whole different way of thinking. There was another guy and myself on this job and we just, the two of us just figured it out and it was like rewiring my brain. Oh my gosh. Um, but was that it, your first job out of college or that during was my, college? That was my second job out of college. My first one was HTML coding at the, in the president's office and kind of teaching that department. Kind of, that was what, what kind of early webmastering job. Yeah, and sort of making the website there and and coding again. So again, you know, kind of moving into the coding space, but it was a whole new set of skills and it was a whole different way of a whole different side of my brain that was getting activated and, and thinking. And it was a way of um, organizing my mind and and uh, kind of tapping into a completely different skill set that I didn't know I had. And um, uh, and, and sort of, it was, it was a learning under duress would <laughs> be one way to put it, but you know, sort of stress sure. learning was, stress yeah. learning was one way to, you know, and it was, it was learning to pay the rent, right? It was like learning mm -hmm. skills to literally pay the rent and, um, but, but diversifying in the moment. Right. And, yeah. and while I had wanted to move in the advertising space, there was just nothing there. And, um, yeah. but it was twenties is the time to really do anything, say yes to everything. And, and I did so HTML and engineering code. And then I went into marketing and event management and 
you know? And so I, I, um, and, and this was the time when, when opportunities were coming and going, cause it's a very tumultuous industry. These, these yeah. companies were tiny, the opportunities were tiny and everything was like, it was like ducks being pulled underwater, right? Like it comes and goes because it was such a tumultuous. Yeah. Uh, it's nothing like it is now. Like startups is a known idea. Yeah. Then it was, a, it was a huge career risk. Like if you would, if you were going to something that you had to explain, you had to explain this stuff to every, to your parents, you had to explain it to your right. peers, like your, your own, your own graduate student, your own kind of peer group didn't understand it. Yeah. Um, nobody had a frame of reference for what these careers were. Um, and it was like you'd kind of fallen off the cliff. You, you went off the map where the dragons were and like nobody kind of knew what you were doing. And um, and so, yeah, HTML and all this stuff was like foreign. And um, and so you were really taking a career hit at kind yeah. of moving into this space. And yeah. it was almost like you were you, you could have said you were mining minerals on Mars. That's sort of what <laughs> and they were yeah. like, good luck. We wish yeah. you well. And, um, and so, yeah, so that's, that's what that first five, six years was like. And, and I moved from Boston to New York, literally on my last dollar. And I'm in this interview and just tor just torpedoing it. Just like, it just was not going well at all. And, um, and then it did. That's amazing. I love that. I love that story. I love that you're like, okay, this isn't, this isn't going well, but you know, so tell me why I, I, I didn't get it. Yeah, just, <laughs> and then you get it. Yeah. Like I need to get out of here because this is not, it's not, <laughs> I, this dog's not going to hunt. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, and it was, it was one of those things where I borrowed my parents' car, which was a tank, you know, <laughs> and I got the job ad and the classifieds, you know, and <laughs> found it in the paper and it was torrential rain and I'm just like, I gotta get, I just gotta get out of here because this isn't, this isn't going to work. And, um, just, yeah, tell me what I need to know to leave. And, um, it's yeah, like the whole loop and was all the brain teasers was all the things that you would expect in the nineties. Like, you know, yeah. the whole covers, like why are manhole covers round and all the thought teasers and the logic questions and the thing. And, um, uh, and I did it and I lasted and I made it and, and uh when it worked out but it was um it was awesome it was a neat ride oh that's that's very very cool uh and i love that you worked through that challenge and just insisted on pushing through and learning uh until you could make it it was a lot of tears yeah <laughs> <laughs> but you did it a lot of tears <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. Uh, amazing. And it paid off. Yeah. It did pay off. Yeah. Do you look back and go, I'm so glad I went through that. Yeah. I mean, I, I had a, I had a diverse portfolio and, um, met some really great people and, um, had, you know, I got bright and shiny projects and, I, yeah. you know, worked on Yahoo calendar and I had some great brands on my resume and, and yeah. made it to Seattle and worked at Real Networks and then Microsoft and, you know, wow. the history. So, yeah. Um, oh, well, let's, let's, let's go, let's go through some of those too. Okay. So, so you're in New York. You, okay. You, you, you've, you've uh, been acquired to know yeah. it. Well, I got acquired and I got a one-way ticket from New York to San Francisco and um, moved to San Francisco and I'm working for Yahoo. Mm -hmm. And, um, the the I thought the stock I thought the real estate was bonkers in '99, um, and I remember um, you know I get out there and um, it was like I don't know if you know the book Microsurfs. Mm -mm. Ever heard of that? That's a, a Douglas Copeland book. It's, I highly recommend it for those who are interested in the Gen X culture. Um, he he wrote a book about. Microsoft in the nineties. And it, it really kind of encapsulated my experience in tech around that time. But, uh, it just, it just, um, it was another world. Like it, it was, um, <clears throat> it, I, I, I left a blizzard and I'm in my parka and my duck boots with, I mean, I'm, I don't know, I was like 26 and <laughs> I come laden 
with New England all over me, right? Yeah. And I, 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 I leave the plane and it's 70 degrees and there's palm trees and, you know, yoga, <laughs> smell of eucalyptus and like, you know, it's a completely different place. Right. Um, and, it, and it looked like it just popped up 50 years ago. Like it's, everything's brand new. And, you know, I, I immediately embrace the West, it's, you know, hiking all the time and going out in the sun and in New England, you know, when it's sunny, you're out. And so yeah. I was out all the time, but I was working a lot. I mean, it was, I mean, it was a hard culture. Yeah, uh, sure. So you're working from what, seven to 10, you're working from the early morning to late at night. It's a sweatshop. It was a startup and everything about the startup is true. If you're working, I mean, that, that misquote that, that the Google's, uh, what's his name mentioned where he misspoke. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, I forget who, who was it that said it? Eric, was it Eric Schultz? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. He said, uh, you know, they decided they didn't want to compete and work from home, and but that's the, that is the truth. I mean, a startup is when when you're competing, you are everyone is there, and that place is operational 24 hours a day. Yeah, and the reason that that stock was at 420 when I was there was because we were there 24 hours a day. Yeah, and um, and that's why stock is high. And, um, and it's because it's off of people's backs and don't, don't think that that's not happening. Right. And so when, when the weekend hit, I was in my car and I was hiking for 48 hours straight. Nice. So I, yeah. I would be in Muir Woods back when you didn't have to sign up to go. Cause I think now the waiting lines are so long, you have to sign up to go in, but I was in this cathedral of sequoias and it was incredible. And I would just go just to be out of the technology. And it was religious for me. And I would just go to kind of like, I just needed to not vibrate anymore, you know? And, and there was a guy selling Cisco stock. Like he was yelling at his stockbroker, like short it, like short it now, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, I gotta, I gotta get out of here. Like I, I gotta, I can't, this place is crazy. Yeah. And so I floated my resume up in Seattle. And like, I've always been curious about, it seems quiet. Like it seems misty and quiet. Like I could, that, yeah. that's the place like I could jive, right? Yeah. And um, and so I've been here about 25 years-ish and uh, really like it. It's a nice place, a nice part of the country. And uh, I don't think it's an accident. There was a lot of software engineers up here because it's dark and rainy and <laughs> <laughs> socially avoidant people end up living here and <laughs> it's famous for mushrooms like that makes sense you know so, <laughs> so do you so, you so you're moving out did you go to microsoft then you said i went up here for real network i got two jobs real network uh-huh i got one from blue nile so which used to sell i, was, I guess it still does sell diamonds over the internet and one from real networks <laughs> the only reason I didn't go to Blue Nile was because I didn't, I couldn't explain it to my parents. Like, oh, there's this company that says diamonds over the internet. And I was like, I can't, I, I can't do that. Yeah. Like, <laughs> even though it's brilliant and it was a brilliant model and I think they made a ton of money. At the time, Real Networks was like a mature startup. Like they were at the time, I think, um, uh, I don't even know if they were like eight years old, um, but they were like the big competitor to Microsoft and they were uh, bringing audio video over the, they had, the, they are why we are talking over the internet in video. Yeah. Right now. Um, and um, they're an amazing, they were an amazing company and they could have been YouTube. Like they could have been so many things, um, but they didn't. And um, anyway, so I, I ended up going to Microsoft um, a couple of years later and um, really kind of marinating in the discipline um, and, and contributing to the discipline of business intelligence as it became a formal function. Um, mm. which was again, another really amazing, uh, that was an amazing ride um, also. And I wrote about that. That was kind of what contributed to the book as a body of knowledge. Um, and my, one of my uh, first bosses wrote the foreword um, for that. And, you know, that's... And which book is that? I'm sorry? Which book is that? 
the book that I just published in February, Driving Data Projects. Um, oh, congratulations. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chad Richardson. Yeah, he wrote the forward to that. And and we we met in 2003, and that's about the time when he approached Satya for the big check to invest in in business intelligence as a as a as an idea. Mm-hmm. And developed the Cosmos platform, and that was the foundation for data for Microsoft as a as a at the at the time for a division, but as a company. Mm-hmm. And um, and so a lot of of the kind of principles um, that we operated by are are you know found kind of are in the book, but but the um, but that was a, an eight-year journey to maturity and um, a lot of bloody knuckle learning. You know, a lot of um, tears from a different, <laughs> for a different reason, right? Like, <laughs> a lot of just sort of yeah. hitting your head against the wall of of um, slow change. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. More and more companies are considering investing in data literacy education, but still have questions about its value, purpose, and how to get the ball rolling. Introducing the newest monthly webinar series from Dataversity, Elevating Enterprise Data Literacy, where we discuss the landscape of data literacy and answer your burning questions. Learn more about this new series and register for free at dataversity.net. Oh my gosh. So I love all the, the learning and the challenges that you take on here. Um, uh, so then, uh, so Microsoft, so then what, and then what? Well, um, then I, uh, so, so one of the, so I, I, I did a ton of projects, um, in Microsoft over that period of time. And we get to a level where I, um, we're sort of off script, but I'm just sort of riffing on this. (laughs) Yeah, that's good. <laughs> where um where I land our first um, governance program, and we're amassing budget. There's a question that's persistent um, uh, that kind of gives me pause, which is, what does the data tell me to do? And it's not unique to Microsoft. It was sort of pervasive across the industry, but it it made me it made me kind of stop in my tracks. And the way that it was phrased. Um, which is uh, it, it kind of hinted at an abdication of, of critical thinking, and it, it's sort of the it it's what made the language of um, data driven versus um, um, I forget the other alternative. I talk about it in the book, and it's but it's a popular phrase: data driven versus data. Um, kind of bringing the thinking back into the conversation. Um, and it prompted me to go get a master's in applied behavioral um, theory and, and continue on for my doctorate in um, IO psychology and to understand more about human bias and decision making and leadership because the problem isn't in the platform, the problem isn't in the technology, the data is operating as designed. It is the bias that we're programming into it. It is the lack of awareness that we have when we're using it. It is the lack of critical thinking or, or insight that we're bringing to it. And the, the inability to challenge its output once we get it. And these tell me features that, that I'm seeing come in software packages now and the fact that AI is so readily available to everyone and so easily consumable and it's so confident you know, as we're playing with it, it sounds so good. And mm-hmm. I, I use this with my students. I mean, it, it does sound good, right? So, so if you don't know how to challenge the output, um, or you don't uh, push back on it, um, you're not adding any value to it. And that lack of dialogue, uh, that lack of reasoning with the box um, is a problem. It's a real, real, it's a real problem. And, um, and so that is what I'm really focused on now is that reasoning capability and value adding capability um, as a as a literacy and fluency um, skill. And um, both in the governing area and in the change management area and as a as a literacy skill for sure, but as a leadership skill. Um, and so so that's my current that's my current focus, both in the teaching arena and the research arena and in the uh, workshop and kind of um, uh, 
uh, consulting area. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, um, so what made you decide to kind of go out on your own and go into teaching and, and leave the corporate world? Um, well, I've been teaching for a long time, sort of in tandem with my work. I just really enjoy it. Um, mm -hmm. And um, it's just a way to give back, but it's a way to, you know, kind of keep a foot in both worlds and, and um, keep sharp on the theory and, and continue. Mm -hmm. I just enjoy research and, and writing. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, the market, you know, the market's just always shifting. So I, you know, I was laid off from Salesforce a year, uh, about a year ago. So hanging, hanging my shingle became a way to kind of stay in the, stay in the flow. So it's fascinating. So, okay. So I missed that, that you you went from Microsoft to Salesforce. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, um, and now, uh, on your own, um, mm -hmm. again, I just, uh, it's such a journey of curiosity and, uh, um, and then I love that you continue to get educated. I think, you know, I keep coming back to that. It's kind of the commonality that I find with data people, right. It's just that curiosity and that desire to learn that passion to learn. Mm -hmm. um, so Christine, uh, uh, tell me what's been your biggest lesson so far in your career? I think there's a few. I think, um, you know, people refer back before data was a function or business intelligence was a function. I was in operations and IT, which is sort of where data sprung from. And they would refer to those functions as plumbing work <clears throat> or sort of the grunt work of, of that you know, area. And I never understood that. I've always thought that operations work was, I've always regarded it as extremely creative and highly strategic. And you need to be a very clean thinker mm -hmm. and an elegant problem solver. And this is where like my brain literally feels the same as when I coded in, in that backend database programming. Like you really need to think logically um, uh, to get the most efficient and effective distance between two points. And I, I didn't say the shortest because people are involved, right? So there's, yeah. you know, whenever people are involved, and this is sort of the next lesson, is that efficient and effective have to be for both data and people because data and people are both very messy. Yeah. And um, project managers often forget that. And, and project certification and project information often forgets that because they look at the world in terms of checklists. And, and, so understand, understanding aspects of change is really critical. And um, so I think that that's, uh, and, I, and I emphasize that in, in the book um, heavily and, and sort of blend a methodology for that, for that reason, because it's, it's the people aspect is, is really essential. Oh, so true. Um, so uh, having worked with data for a while now, so what is your definition of data? Well, I actually talk about this in the book as well. Um, that, it, that I love this. Um, I actually looked it up um, when I was writing about this, and it's both a noun and a philosophy. Don't you love that? I do. And and as an English major, I love it. Like it really. When I I smiled when I read it, and when I wrote about it, because I was like, oh, I love that. Like it, the noun part is facts and statistics, and the philosophy part are things known and assumed to be facts. Mm. And, um, and I think that's significant and it speaks to me from a psychology standpoint and it speaks to my career in data. And it says something I think about our societal state as well, that everything counts as data. Yeah. And it means everyone's right. And that's, uh, I think that's telling. Mm -hmm. And that we're all under the same tent, whether we like it or not. Yeah. And um, so I, I talk in the book about how data is, is many, many things, like it's information and language and it prompts feelings and um, it can be art and be regarded as an asset. But ultimately, I think that it should be a great source of humility that um, that you know, for leaders at every level, that everyone needs to be more comfortable and confident communicators with data, and that we must challenge um, where the data comes from and understand if it's clean enough and observing data is sometimes uh, sufficient to make a solid decision, um, you know, from a trend. Um, 
you know, for other decisions, specific data is needed, but, you know, conversations about data, such as understanding our colleagues' logic in a building and building a business case or justification of a decision um, are just as valuable as the data itself. And so humility, but humility is something that has to be modeled. And um, leaders have to demonstrate a genuine humility with data, especially senior sponsors of, of initiatives. And that's not something you see a lot of in, in organizations where a manager or a leader, um, and, and they're also the ones that carry culture through mm. their behaviors, right? How, mm. what's permissible? What is, what is considered okay to do, right? Is it okay to ask questions? Is it okay not to know something? And how does one demonstrate that genuinely, right? Like, mm -hmm. do, we, do we all understand what we mean by ethical decision-making? Like, we mm -hmm. kind of go around the room and say what we mean by that and, and, and give an example, you know, just so that we're all on the same page. Like, what would an open discussion even look like if it's not modeled? Right. Right. Because we all know what to put for compliance videos. Like we all know what the wrong answer is for for legal compliance training and go through the motions for that stuff. But when it really comes to the uh, <clears throat> the application of policies and stuff, I mean, things get real when when the business is trying to negotiate with the data team on, you know, how we're going to put the stuff in play. The compliance videos aren't there. Right. Yeah. So, so humility is, I think, really um, important. Uh, I agree. I, I absolutely agree. And and uh, if you decide to queue up that conversation, Christine, I'd love to sit in. <laughs> I think it would be amazing and fascinating. And um, I, you know, as a as an analyst, I love the conversations of just you know what does a word mean and just what do we mean by this? Yeah. And um, you know, it, it, it's it's it, I don't know. I just get into it. <laughs> so I, do too. I think it's fascinating it because is. no one ever agrees. I mean, just definitions, just the metadata of things. There's never agreement. Mm -hmm. And um. And I love that as a kind of a corporate anthropologist because you just sit there and watch the language go around the room and what do right. people value and what do they cling to and what do they, you know, what do they hold dear and what are they willing to cast aside and all that stuff is so telling around the cultural, um, you know, the things that they're uh, trying to hold on to and why. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so. Uh... Do you then see the importance of data management and the number of jobs working with data increasing or decreasing over the next 10 years and why? How do you see this evolving? Well, I mean, I'm seeing things evolve right now just with the AI injection in job descriptions, like just in the in the roles that, that I do, strategy and governance. Mm -hmm. And I have a blog post. We, we should have a whole podcast on this. There's some... Um, Coding requirements like R, SQL, and Python are being injected into strategy and governance roles when they're not needed. Mm -hmm. and, um, their recruiters are using AI to do job descriptions, and it's they're 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 sifting out probably eighty five percent of their viable candidates that way. Mm. And I don't know if they know that, and or maybe they do. I don't know, but they're they're if they want a a metadata cataloger as their strategist, they're not going to get a real strategist. If they want double duty, what they're doing is attracting a vertical thinker. Mm -hmm. They want like an ex data strategist or an ex um, architect as a strategist. That's a horizontal thinker. And what they're doing is, is, is getting a, they're monocropping. Mm -hmm. They're not, they're not getting a diversity of thought and and it's it's um it's it's sort of the antithesis of what started the internet right which is this diversity of thought yeah. you've got so many diverse heads around the table um i mean i i really couldn't i cannot stress enough 
how many degrees we had and how many diverse degrees we had in that original startup. It was like the UN. Yeah. I mean, zoology, it was wildlife, wow. wildlife, like it was everything. Wow. Yeah. And just everything. And you would have these ideas coming from just left field and, and, and they would work. Like it was just, you know, things just, you know, because you had different thinkers and when you get this sort of myopic, you know, the sort of group think going on, um, they don't negotiate the same way. And then you're going to get this siloed view. And, and I mean, it makes the book that I have more relevant than ever, because these people have a harder time, even harder than horizontal thinkers negotiating with business stakeholders. Mm. Um, yeah. It's <laughs> twice as hard. <clears throat> it, 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 yeah, very much so. Yeah. Generally speaking. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a hard thing to uh build that diversity. Yeah, the ego doesn't want us to let to do that. <laughs> but uh but it's so important. It is yeah, but data teams, I mean, even though you want people want to put us all in the same bucket, it's a diverse, it's a mm-hmm. It's a neuro, it's a diverse, neurodiverse group. Mm-hmm. It is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and you, you need to populate that. You need to populate that diverse diversity intentionally. I think that's what I love about data. And, and then, and just as I, I do think the jobs will expand um, as more companies pay attention to their data. Uh, uh I think, but, and that's kind of why I started this podcast is to talk about, you know, the diversity of, and the, the lack of linear path to uh, oh, yeah. data, right. And how it does bring that diversity um, because there's currently no, you know, degree in data modeling or, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing um, or courses or, you know, so um, at least collegiate, uh, but, uh, um, but yeah, it's it's really really exciting. I think, uh, and and very good advice. So then, what would advice would you give to people looking to get into a career in data management? Um, well, <clears throat> well, I think there's much more of a straight path than there used to be. Yes. Um, I and and much more available information. And I would say, you know, buy my buy my book. I'm just kidding, but um. I think beyond curiosity and passion, which I think passion is really bad advice, um, but uh, I think it's to become a clear thinker. Mm. And clear clear thinking is one of the biggest lessons that I've come to learn, and it, it came to me the hard way. Um, and there's an emotional and intellectual component to that. <clears throat> I was diagnosed very late in life with... Um, high functioning autism as well as phonological dyslexia and before i had awareness and after i had awareness uh, i have the same thing in common i i can't control and i will never know how people feel about me right but it made it easier to accept that oh this is just what it is right this is how i think Mm -hmm. and um and that's not i don't care what people think like it's not like an f you it's just that it is what it is and being honest about how i'm feeling or instead of retreating, um, like I'm feeling insecure or I'm a little bored with what we're talking about right now, or like just being straight, yeah. um, you know, and that can get validated for whatever reason, because I'm making it funny or people thought it was a joke so they can hear it better. Um, you know, that, that's what, um, that's what helps the depressed state of not knowing how people feel about you. Um, and and that's the only thing I can do is to be honest in that moment. Um, and the best way of being honest is to be in touch with that mm. feeling. Right. Mm. Um, and it makes me, that's what makes me attuned to my coaching. It makes me attuned to my stakeholders. It makes me attuned to myself. Um, and those are the things that help me connect with others. And that is something that I really really, really struggled with growing up. Um, and uh, a lot of what I learned and experienced through life is through nonverbal observation. And there is, you know, so that 
I'll, I'll not go through what education and, and adult development misses in, in trainings, because I just think there's so much that we can learn about autism and neurodivergent people in terms of like, we learn so much through mapping mm -hmm. uh, sports and arts and things like that through nonverbal communication, but there's a whole segment to be done on that. But I think it's become really chic to call this type of um, uh, classification a superpower. Um, and we put this burden on neurodivergence to be either this kind of rock star savant like Bill Gates or who honestly has his own behavioral tics. Um, he just has really good PR and or um, pity the person who's like rocking in the corner um, and can't tie their shoes. And there's this kind of silent majority who are just not at the same party as everyone else. Right. Sure. And they need to learn how to give each other safe places. And. The intellectual component is I'm just a natural builder. And I think that I think in both abstract and strategic terms, um, and that's something I learned about myself when I was doing the coding and came out, you know, as an English major and I forced myself to do coding. Um, and I, I just love building frameworks around messy problems and I, I get into the details as well. And so I'm always tying theory to practice. And so my managers would have, um, you know, a part of the business that was like a bramble thicket and they knew they could drop me in that area and I would turn it into a Midwestern grid system by the end of the year. You know, they, so when you find how to think clearly about a problem, everything, and I mean, everything falls into place after that. Yeah. Um, and it's about aligning your skill set, whether that's graphics or UX, or in my case, being a word nerd or a framework, you know, person. Um, you know, thinking about problems in the right way with the right people. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, so I, I really, really, really appreciate you sharing that uh, and getting personal, personal and vulnerable. You know, and, and I think that's such an important message and great advice. You know, to and so just to kind of define, you know, clear thinking, just really being honest with yourself and knowing yourself. Um, so you can adapt and, and, and I think that works for any career, not just in data management. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, Christine, Thank you. Yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I really appreciate it. Um, uh, this has been such a pleasure. Uh, I really have enjoyed talking with you today. Um, again. Okay. So. Uh, if you would repeat for us one more time the name of your book and where we, um, we can go buy it. Driving Data Projects, a huh. comprehensive guide, and it's on Amazon or wherever books are sold. I love it. And <laughs> if people wanted to solicit your services, how would they find you? ChristineHaskell.com. Perfect. Oh, well, Christine, again, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, and to all of our listeners out there, if you'd like to keep up to date in the latest podcasts and in the latest in data management education, you may go to datariscity.net forward slash subscribe. Until next time, stay curious, everyone. Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks, a podcast brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational webinars at datariscity.net forward slash subscribe.